People seem to forget, if you change today, today will change your life. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Excellent. Very good. Thank you very much, Paul. Oh, thank you for your time. And uh, really, just most importantly for us, is how you're doing during this really, really crazy time and during this pandemic. How's it going for you? Uh, I really can't complain. I think a lot of people are um, harder hit than we are. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've seen an, uh, you know, an increase, actually, in um, an inbound lead generation. One of the things our company does help is help with supply chain um, automa uh, automation. And... Um, and saves people a lot of time in the manufacturing and engineering world. So it's been, um, I don't want to say it's going to be good for business because obviously, you know, cool. <laughs> it's not good yes. for anyone, but, yes. uh, yeah. but it's, but it's, you know, in, in that sense, we're lucky. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm glad to hear. And you're right. It's, it's always a choice of phrasing, isn't it? Because, you know, I have more people coming my way, but it, it's, you know, through tough times, it's great that you can provide a service for people. I think that's, that's just a fantastic thing. Whenever, whenever the world is in a, a difficult situation, if you can provide a service that makes lives e easier, then, uh, then that's a fantastic thing. So Paul, for, the, for those of you, uh, for the people who won't be familiar, can you just talk, tell us a little bit more about yourself? I've obviously done, you know, know plenty of, about you by this point, but for people listening, just a bit more about what you do. Sure. Uh, about myself personally or about... Yeah, me? please give us a bit of both if that's all right. Uh, Okay, sure. I'll try to be brief, but brevity is not my strongest suit. Um, <laughs> okay, take your um, time. Uh, I was born, grew up in the uh, in the U.S. in um, Cincinnati, Ohio, on the west side, and uh, was homeschooled from a very early age. And um, that meant I got to focus on things that I really liked. So I got means that I also skipped a lot of stuff. So uh, very confused on American history every now and then, and English <laughs> literature because I skipped it as a kid. But uh, I got to really focus on science and math and things that I loved. So uh, I got to take you know college chemistry at twelve. Um, I got to go to Harvard for um, astrophysics at 16. Um, it was really cool. I got to, you know, really focus on things that I, I like focusing on. And, um, you know, my, my goal from the beginning of my life was just to leave a big positive footprint on the world. You know, the biggest footprint I can leave and point it in the right direction, you know, uh, in human progress. And so for me, doing that was either through science or technology. And, um, you know, around the time that I was really doing a lot of deep diving in this, I realized it's actually, you know, um, it's a combination of both. You need science is the knowledge that empowers technology. We need technology to actually get utilization out of science. So I decided that the best way for me to contribute would be through a really high tech startup that is not just like an app, but something that would um, create real tangible value for our entire industries. And I decided that, you know, I, I still wanted to get a, de a degree, a college degree. So, but I thought astrophysics didn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Um, so I thought, you know, what would make a lot of sense would be German law. Uh, I'm kidding. It, it wasn't, it wasn't that obvious, but, um, but, but, but I, got, I got to go uh, on exchange year while <laughs> I was there and uh, over to Switzerland. And I learned, well, Swiss German, which is close enough. Uh -huh. pretty, uh, um, and then I, I learned the language well enough. And I um, got into um, the university over there and uh, went to Heidelberg University in Germany, which is like their equivalent of Harvard. Um, it's really good for law and it's a really cool place. And uh, you know, I decided, look, this would be actually be a better training for business and entrepreneurship, I think, than you know, staying in the sciences would. So I decided to um, go forward with that. I was also tempted by the fact that, they, that I was told, and I don't know if this is true, but I was told several times over there that if you actually passed the bar here, you know, you'd be the first, um, you know, American citizen born and raised in the U.S. who, you know, to move to Germany and pass this bar. Oh, right. Like, okay. Yeah, you know, very different language and everything. So. Um, so that was kind of cool. And I thought yeah, that might actually give me an edge. I might be able to get a job somewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, so I took that. Uh, it was probably the either the best or the worst decision I've ever made in my life. I can't decide. But <laughs> loved every moment of it. I did pass. I did very well. But man, was it hard. They have a really high fail out rate. And it, there's a reason no one ever did it before. Uh, I, I believe it. It's, it's, it's really, it might be it's a very foolish decision in some ways because your odds are very low but um anyway so did that and uh worked at a law firm very briefly i was starting i funded this whole thing through startups ever since i was 16 i've always had a startup of some sort um self-employed and uh you know and, and hired other people out to, to uh, help me build technology and um after law school especially considering i focused on ip law about the closest you can get to technology and law um it really uh, i noticed there's a really big problem which was we could find digital um, assets of companies like, you know, if someone was stealing your logo or, you know, a video or, or uh, music or whatever. But as soon as it was three-dimensional, you know, when it came to like patent lawsuits, mm. it was always after the fact. It was never, um, 
it was always reactive versus uh, preventative. And so I realized that you know, there's a, there a lacking technology there. So I looked into three-dimensional search capabilities and three-dimensional analysis and found a couple things that said that they did it. And we then went back to the US, started up this company called FISNA, which is short for physical DNA. And the very first thing I did, I mean, the company didn't have a name, it wasn't even a company yet, but I um, found my co-founder, uh, Glenn Warner, who um, unfortunately passed away a few years later, but he, um, you know, he and I took on this problem. We, we looked at every software in the industry, really wanting to use somebody else's technology to kind of solve uh, you know, more specific problems. We were looking to build something fundamental at the start, but everything just was really inadequate for what we were looking at. I mean, hey, you couldn't find parts within parts. Um, you know, if you cut a part in half, it would not understand it anymore. Um, the processing speed was terrible the accuracy was even worse and it was just like man, nothing was working so we thought okay it's not viable um we either need to build our own technology or give up on this idea and we thought oh, let's, i mean i already moved i already just moved continents so i might as well give it a shot and uh, put everything i had into that we uh you know went into a lot of personal debt <laughs> and uh you know and for the first time in my life and um it took about nine months for a whole team of coders to come up with something that actually worked. And it's based off of, um, actually, ironically, of all things, astrophysics was the inspiration for the yeah. And essentially what FISNA does is it's short for physical DNA, like I mentioned, and it, it codifies three-dimensional data, regardless of the file type, regardless of how, where it comes from, regardless of how it's expressed and its viewer. Um, it, it normalizes that and it codifies it in a way so that the three-dimensional real world that we live in makes sense to the two-dimensional world of data and software. Mm -hmm. And so that it really, by bridging the gap between reality and the digital world, it's really cool because it opens up so many uh, different use cases and so much um, techno technological um, opportunities. And at the time, I didn't realize that. I, I just thought we were solving an IP law problem. <laughs> so <laughs> we, just, we went to a couple of conferences and we were telling people like, hey, I can, I can catch people who are trying to steal your stuff for you. And they were like, how? And we explained the technology behind it. They were like, well, why do you even care about that? We've got yeah. so many other things we can do with that technology. My like, God, you could speak, you could like triple our, our engineering speed. You could help automate procurement and supply chains. You could help with field workers. You could make a, you know, a maintenance expert out of any person because we can show them how exactly these parts go together, mm. um, uh, different component options. And um, so we realized there was a lot of different things we could do with the technology. So we decided to start building them out and um, skip forward a couple of years. And that's where we are today. We've, you know, we've been validated as best in class. Um, yeah, it's really been this class with us. So that, you know, we're definitely by far the best. We were valued um, for that by um, uh, by government agencies, by large um, fortune, you know, top fortune companies, mm. and, and and you know, time and again against everything else in the industry. And it's it's really exciting because we you know we're um, heading into a really open field, and um, we've been able to see the impact of our software now. It's not just the cool tech; it's actually you know saving people's. Uh, money for sure, time definitely, but also in some cases lives because they're, they're they're not making the same mistakes they would make in engineering. They're not making the wrong, they're not buying the wrong parts, and they're identifying you know a crucial yeah. um, alternatives for replacements. As I, as I, it's incredible, and, and just just for people, you know, you, you've touched on a few a sort of few very specific examples there, but just in terms of just talking even more in terms of how it's transforming the engineering world can you just give us the people listening like an idea in terms of scale and in terms of in terms of like actual speed and any way that we can quantify it in our heads in terms of how radic a radical difference this really does make a good analogy would be like think of how long it takes for a google source to show up right yeah. it's, a, it's a media and the same is true for a search in 3d and um and that's a really big change from the, what was possible in the past the, the other thing about the reason i also like using google as an analogy is because well first of all everyone understands it but um but think about it like this if you're looking for text google is great right because they can find all the texts out there and whatnot um but if you're looking for and, and 2d images it does a pretty good job with that too um but when it, you're talking about three-dimensional data you know, um, you need to, it's a totally different language. You can't analyze it as text, you can't analyze it as 2D. And we can, you know, with machine learning, we can predict the text that makes sense for that. We can predict attributes about it. We can uh, we, we can match 2D to 3D, mm -hmm. but, and, and vice versa. But when it comes to finding 3D data, what people have been doing in the past is they've been saying, okay, I've got a three-dimensional model of whatever, an engine, let's say, and they have to type in the word engine. But if somebody over in, you'd say, a different, comp a different country was working on that engine too, they'll call it something else, right? And um, if you acquired another company and their, you know, their models are called something totally different, and in reality, they don't call anything engine. They have these long, complex part numbers, and no one knows them, right? No one memorizes these part numbers. So what happens is people design the same things over and over and over and over again, which is a problem 
important for a lot of reasons. One, it's time consuming, expensive for the engineers, they're not innovating, they're just redoing things from scratch. Secondly, it's a problem because all those new parts they're designing, they end up having, what happens is in supply chain, people order all those duplicate parts. Uh, without realizing that they're all the same thing because they have different part numbers. And so they're ordering, like, if you, if you have 500 types of bolts for different things that you need to build, they're ordering 500 individual orders from 500 different vendors versus one giant order from the best price vendor. So that's a huge problem. And then when it comes to maintenance and repair or um, even just, like, inventory management, people will actually say, oh, I need to place an emergency order for this bolt that we ran out of because otherwise our machines are shut down or we can't take off uh, the airplane or whatever your use case is. Um, and so things don't happen, you know, entire companies go down for, uh, for you know, days or weeks mm -hmm. or whatever, while for a part to come in. But in reality, what we're finding is that often they've got 499 spares <laughs> in this hypothetical <laughs> example. They're just called different things, right? right. So, so that's, the, that's the issue. And it's actually, what's fascinating to me is that in terms of numbers like you asked for, um, software engineers, most people, um, you know, most studies that you read show that software engineers are about five times as productive as mechanical engineers. And it's not because they're five times smarter, or it's because they have tools that they take for granted mm -hmm. like copy paste or search sure. or you know what's the difference between this code and that code or where was this code snippet used they don't have that in CAD uh, or in any 3D application unless they manually tag it themselves and, and everybody ta tags it the exact same way which doesn't happen so it, they, that all leads to a very significant slowdown and it's actually a, a I, I think a lot, a growing number of people think that's one of the reasons why if you watch like Back to the Future and you look at what they predicted the future would look like, they were totally underestimated how far software would come along. Right. But they totally overestimated how far we would make it in physical gadgetry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and that's, it's harder to innovate a physical good than it is a digital one. Uh -huh. And we're trying to make that the same and easier. Okay, okay. And for something that's such an, like an exceptionally technical product and, you know, heavily dependent on clever programming and machine learning and all of that stuff, you have to have assembled a pretty smart team around you. And it's when I hear that, when I hear this sort of kind of innovation and everything else, you just think of who are the people that are involved. And so for many people who are listening, who might be, you know, with their own businesses or leaders or CEOs or founders or whatever, assembling the right people around you is so incredibly important. So there's yep. this amazing work that you're doing. And I'm really, I'm just curious as to how do you make sure that you get the right people around you? And, you know, how do you know if, how do you know if what they're telling you is right? Because, you know, you've got your <laughs> expertise, but obviously you are also reliant and codependent on bringing the best in class to come work with you to give you insights that maybe you or others can't see as well. So how, how do you find that right blend? How do you find that right team? Oh, man, I wish that I had a, perf a really short and simple a a answer for that. But the, the truth of the matter is that, um, you know, as CEO, my goal is to eventually become the dumbest person in the company. I'm becoming dumber over time, but because <laughs> I'm bringing in smarter and smarter yeah, people. Yeah. Right? So it, my goal is to always to find people who are more talented than I do. And you're right. When it comes to, you know, highly specialized technical areas, I'm not completely technically illiterate, but absolutely we get into areas that I just don't understand as well as they do. Or, I mean, if, and if I did, then I'd be doing something wrong on my end, right? I need to hire smarter people. So what you have to do, I, and I've learned this the hard way. I did. I, I've, made, I've made very bad hiring decisions in the past, not just with business before it. You know, I've, I've learned a lot from them. Um, you have to hire someone who you know, uh, you can validate as being very, very good based on what they've done in the past. Like hire someone who really is best in class. Hire someone who's a world, you know, world renowned or just has an, an amazing reputation and someone who's validated their uh, abilities, not just over a phone interview or a physical interview with you, but um, based on the references on, on their past experiences, the work that they've done, so that you can get one solid person you can really, really trust for a given area. So in this case, let's say for machine learning, for te just technology in general, right? And then rely on them, you know, to to be the, the that person that figures out um, when, when other people apply for mm -hmm. other roles, right? Are they telling the truth? Are they, you know, making something up? Are they actually this good? And uh, and and that's how you grow, right? Is, is by relying on a couple of really, really good people in a couple of really good areas that you can independently uh, verify and validate and then trust and leaning on them. Um, you're totally right though. To, I would never have been able to build all this on my own. Even if I multiplied myself, I, I don't have the technical skill set, right, to do it. And um, and hiring people is a big challenge. It's something that you have to accept that you'll probably get wrong occasionally. Because uh, some people are really good at interviewing. They're not that great when they actually get to work. You learn that from um, 
I mean, honestly, I feel like most of what I've learned from about hiring people is um, it's almost like a psychological level, right? It, it's I can talk to somebody for half an hour if I'm looking for this information. I can figure out what their motives likely are, if they're likely telling me the truth about something, what they really want out of a job. If, are they job motivated, career motivated, calling motivated? Um, you know, how passionate are they about this area? And then, um, and then I get it about, uh, and I have another person who has more technical experience than I do, um, validate that they have the skill set that's needed. And between those two assessments, you can make some really good hires. We've hired some really amazing people here in just the past two months. You know, even with everything that's going on with coronavirus, um, we're still hiring, and we've hired um, really world class um, talent here just recently. It's amazing the people who we've built to our track. Okay. And with. Uh, in terms of you know like any business you're always working on the business of today and you're also working on the business of tomorrow or the business of the future you've got to do both simultaneously just just to get an understanding of your business will the work that you do at some point or maybe it does now transform the lives uh, sorry transform the world for non-engineers like yeah. the majority of us day to day and i'd love to know what that looks like in, in your headspace today and going on in the future that's a, I'm so glad that you asked the question. That's a really, really good question. And, uh, and, and that's something that uh, I really want to touch on. So, so it's, you're totally right. Um, and if you'll allow me to do another analogy, Please, if you go back yeah. to 19, 1980, right? And uh, you were to look around 1980 and ask how many people know how to code software? Very, very, very few. And but at the same time, how many people were accessing and dealing with software? Very few, right? Or just only in a professional setting, right? You didn't have apps on your phone or anything like that. Um, skip forward to today, and there again, coding is extremely popular. Uh, you know, millions of Americans know how to code and code daily. And um, but and and you also have so much access to it. It's on your phone. And what precipitated the growth of um, interest in coding was the exposure to more software. And it wasn't just computer software; it was apps, right? It's something that everyone dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis, part of their daily lives, and it inspired people to code more. And you can see there was this huge bell curve, this this, this this exponential growth in coders after you know the iPhone, the smartphone came out. Many more people were interested in coding after that than before. And so what you need is you need a, a, a you need a, a sort of like a technological, or I guess you could say almost like a market-based driver of interest. And at the same time, you need an enabling technology. So there was a driver in interest because of the smartphone. That was the mechanical thing that made people mm -hmm. interested in, in coding. And then there was a driver in interest as a result of that because it was affecting their daily lives. And we're gonna have the exact same, we are having the exact same thing happen in 3D. And it's happening a lot faster than people think. The problem is that to release something in 3D, like AR, VR, um, you know, mixed reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D printing, these, have, these are technologies where it's, it, it takes a while to get over a certain hurdle and then magically boom you hit it just like the iphone right, right? we didn't have a sort of iphone and then an iphone we had nokia <laughs> nokia nokia brick 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 <laughs> maybe a flip phone in there and then bam you got an iphone right and so the same thing's happening is, is happening in the other space too where you know we've been struggling for a while google glass tried to come out didn't really work but you know apple's working on that now and everyone's working on their own version of that at some point we will have whether it's glass or something else augmented reality will play a bigger part in our lives virtual reality is already playing a bigger part in our lives and mixed reality is going to become a much bigger thing in the future than it is today in addition to that you have 3d printing where and outside of 3d printing even if you don't like that, if you're not a hobbyist, you don't want to build something like that. At some point in your life, you're going to want something that's different than what happens to be on the market, and you don't have to print it at home. In reality, you're not going to probably spend the money you would need to spend on an amazing 3D printing machine to build something at home. But there's uh, another trend that's happening, which is advanced manufacturing. It's basically the democratization of manufacturing. So, what, so in other words, what I'm trying to say in the most long-winded way possible, apparently, is that there, is, there are economic drivers right now. They're going to, they're exposing people to more and more and more 3D and will be in the near future. The big problem has been that um, understanding 3D has been challenging, right? Um, you, if you ever worked in CAD or you've ever worked with any 3D program, you'll understand what I mean. It's not, it's, it's not very intuitive. Um, it, 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 the model doesn't behave the way that you would think at first glance. You have to really learn it. Every system is a little bit different. Um, most of these programs look like they were built in 1972, and they're all gray boxes and right. tons, tons of buttons. They're not easy to use. They're not user friendly, and so most people are afraid of touching it. They think it's it's very complicated. There aren't you know simple ways of interacting. So what we're trying to do at FISNA is bridge that gap by simplifying it and by and the way that we simplify it is you know give them a great view you know let them see the model 
let them understand the data behind the model without having to manually go in and get it. So one thing we do is we automate the analysis. So instead of, you know, if you're a CAD engineer and you want to know the whole diameter on something, you might open up the file, you figure out how to rotate it specifically, you figure out what the hole's supposed to be, you go and you measure it manually with the that's a nightmare for someone who's not a CAD engineer. So what we do is we automate that. And if you want to find the hole diameter, we say, fine, here, look it up. What hole diameter do you want? Mm -hmm. Anyone click on it, click on a hole. All right, we'll highlight the hole for you. And then uh, it will tell you what the diameter is. Yeah, we'll tell you what all the diameters are. We'll tell you what all these parts are. We'll tell you can take a picture to find a 3D model. You can describe it without knowing the part number to find a 3D model. One big problem out in the industry right now is that if you go to a website like Thingiverse or RampCAD or anything like that, where you're trying to find a 3D model for consumer use as a, maybe a 3D printer uh, enthusiast or whatever you are, um, it's try finding something very specific, right? If you type in rabbit, you'll find 5,000 rabbits, right? If you try to find, if you type in like ice cube maker, you'll find a thousand ice cube makers. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to narrow down what you're looking for. And, um, and by the way, for the thousand that you found, there are probably 70,000 that you didn't find because yeah, they were in different yeah. languages or something different. So we're, we're bridging that gap by simplifying the process. And, and with FISNA, actually the majority of our users now are non-engineers, the people in supply chain, people in maintenance, people who've never had access to a 3D model before, but now it's really simple for them so um, only you know about a tenth of the users that we're experiencing are actually you know professional 3d engineers okay and so and you mentioned you know when we started speaking in terms of the non-engineering aspects and sort of your desire to talk about that is, is very very clear and so what, what i'm quite keen to know is for you going forward what is the thing that excites you the most what are you looking forward to being able to provide people the most just for not in terms of your in terms of the business but for you personally what's the thing that really gets you excited specifically what gets me excited is um so there's different types of companies right you you, you have startups that are or companies in general that I would say there's three types. There's a companies that have a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And they typically don't do well. Then you've got companies that are, have a solution to a problem and those are simple. And then you have companies rarely, but occasionally you have companies that have a, a solution to multiple problems. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, and those are hard to run because you have to order, you, you can't go after every opportunity and you have to figure out the sequencing and you, have, you don't want to narrow it in too much, but at the same time, you can't be too broad. So, and that's really where we fit. Um, the what excites me about what we're doing is that, you know, in that third category, you have this opportunity to not be just an app or not be a specific, you know, one single product, mm -hmm. but to actually enable an entire field, an entire category of technology. And in my mind, and I, I very strongly believe this, and a lot of research backs this up, um, that the next giant leap in technology is not going to be some new device. And it's not going to be some new app. It's going to be merging digital and physical right. technology, right? Mm -hmm. The merger of the digital and the physical worlds is amazing. And, and, to give you, to put into perspective, if you take a really high resolution 2D picture of, uh, of something, right? Um, even if it's extremely heavy, you know, 50 megabytes or whatever, right? Um, that, that 2D picture contains less than one ten thousandth the data and value that a simple 3D model of that, mo uh, of that same thing would contain, even if it's only a, a hundredth of that weight. So there's so much more data you can get out of 3D, and we barely scratch the surface in understanding that. So for me, enabling that is amazing. And what I'm really looking forward to in the future is seeing how people use that core technology to open up other applications. There are applications that we don't have the ability to build in the house right now. Just we don't, we don't have the ability to build 500 products. So things like you know being able to recognize tumors at an earlier stage that's possible with 2D AI. With 3D AI, you could do it much more efficiently, much earlier. But um, so if we can give other companies the technology, you know, through an API or what have you, to enable that, that excites me. That excites me. And just also just seeing people interact with a more I guess I, could, I would describe it like this. The world around us is a, a combination of natural patterns and human-made patterns. Right now, you and I are, are conversing in a human-made pattern called English, right? This is our pattern, right? This is how I understand. You, I can get my thoughts and, from my brain into your brain, right? Um, but then there are natural patterns everywhere, too. Uh, it, it, you know, Fibonacci sequences, for example, right? right, right uh -huh. that, that they kind of get rid of them. If you can start to merge the two, you get into an area of technology that's almost kind of like matrixy in a way. And what it does is democratizes creativity. And I think that people have so much more value um, that they can unleash than they realize. And every, mm -hmm. What makes us human is our creative ability. And if, if everybody had the ability on a whim to design something 
um, for interaction either in a digital or the physical world without having to go through years of training on how to use some other some stupid software program and how to do it. <laughs> you know, that would fundamentally change how, um, not only how we perceive the world around us, but how the world around us would look and Absolutely, feel. Absolutely, yeah. Innovation much faster than we do now. Yeah. That's so really interesting. And uh, for anyone who exhibits the kind of hunger and drive that you have, where you know i could ask you i could ask you a very cliche question where did that come from but what i'd find more interesting is actually when when you were younger and you first what you called is had that sort of first realization that you wanted to leave a footprint who did you look up to in terms of leaders in terms of inspiring figures in terms of someone else going that's how you leave a footprint and i want to do something similar what did that look like to you when you were younger to me, it looked like, um, you know, back when the History Channel had history on it, uh, <laughs> I used to watch, you know, the documentaries all the time. I loved it. And, and I, I looked at people like, you know, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, and, and and you look at what, not only what they did, but the consequences of it, right? Like mm. if, if, you, if you go from one person like Galileo or so, whatever, and, and you go forward to the generations, you're like, oh my God, that one person had un unimaginable impact on the future. They didn't get the, they didn't necessarily live to see all of it, but they really cool. unleashed a whole new, they innovated in a way that didn't create a thing. They created a way that allowed other, they innovated in a way that allowed other people to innovate better and faster. It's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a multiplying exponential effect that they had on uh, human development. And that to me was just like the ultimate you know, I mean, this, is, this is the ultimate thing to accomplish with your life. And I'm like, I've got one chance to live my life. I don't want to just consume. I, I you know, I get to live a really comfortable life um, compared to people in the, you know, in the past and then like medieval times. And so because we have great technology now and I'm not going to die from the first cold I get, you know, I, I, yeah. you know we're going to be, live longer. We live healthier. We live happier. And we do that because of technology. And I think it would be kind of selfish to just consume that but not contribute back and give something back to the world. So the people I looked up to, you know, I saw them, maybe part of the nice thing here was that by being homeschooled um, and you know, being largely self taught, I wasn't around, I mean, I, I was around other kids, but not as much. And um, I think that the, oh, there might've been a negative effect on that. Maybe that's why I talk a mile a minute and, and, and don't have any sense of brevity, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but the positive effect on that for me was I got to think bigger picture and I got to think about like, how do I measure up to these, you know, historical figures versus how do I measure up to my classmates uh -huh. and, yeah. and my buddies, right? I think that a lot of people get stuck in that peer to peer um, sure. trap. And uh, I think that I was able to kind of get out of that just because I didn't have the opportunity to think that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, there's always that, 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 uh, those studies or that reference point of you are the sum of the 10 people you you know you spend your time with and actually exactly what you said maybe you actually the time you were spending with is some of these greats or some of these geniuses and that's where you were almost the people you were connecting with on a daily basis through word or through paper or through online um that those that that was the sum of that rather than pe your peers at school where i think you're right people get trapped in they think of the 10 people closest to them at school and maybe they get stuck in stuck being you know a choice of word but whatever word you might use um might have you're right it might affect someone's outcome in terms of where they might go and following on from that particular point is do you think it's easier or harder now to leave a footprint either way it could be it could be a lot easier in the sense that obviously there's so many more avenues and opportunities and there's a, you know people today we're starting further and further along than the, our predecessors started on and some of the examples you gave but maybe it's it maybe because there is so much it's harder to do so than it was for them and i'm just curious from your point of view you want to leave a footprint do you think it's easier or harder to do now it's both um and what i mean by that is so it's fairer in the sense that you know if you go far, far, uh, back far enough in history, the odds of you making it to be five years old were pretty low, yeah. right? Uh, <laughs> there was no written record. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, you go far enough back and there's no real way to leave a meaningful impact, uh, at least not a very long lasting one. 
But if you go to the modern age, I mean, think about it, like the number of people who were alive, um, you know, a thousand years ago was a tiny fraction of the number of people we have alive today on Earth. And, uh, and so in that sense, it's harder because there are more people. But on the other hand, you have, everybody has all the tools they need. Um, even people who are living in poverty, you know, at least, maybe not, you know, in extreme examples, but at least in the, you know, more or less developed world, uh, even people who are kind of in that in the poverty level, they, I mean, I didn't, I certainly didn't grow up with rich uh, at all, or, uh, but like, I think that they have more opportunity than they ever had in the past. It's more democratized in the sense, because if you have access to the internet and you have a computer, you can change the world, um, mm -hmm. period. And, and if you don't need to even buy it, you can go to a library and you have that tool yeah. all of a sudden to change the world. So, you know, virtually everybody, um, you, you know, has that opportunity now um that they didn't have in the past there are more people but i think that i would say it's easier because um if you really have that drive and you really have that ambition and you're really going to put in the effort to deserve to change the world <laughs> then you absolutely have the ability to do so now um in the past it would have been a lot easier to incidentally change the world <laughs> than it would be today. yeah okay okay so and <laughs> on that on that route of trying to change the world uh no doubt You've, you've obviously, like everyone else, had many a setback along the way. Yeah. I'm just curious. It's always, in, you know, it's it's always a question you can ask someone who gets to a to gets to any level, but it's always still interesting to know what the answers are. Which is, between those setbacks, we don't necessarily need to know what they are unless you want to share them. But actually, at, at what points and how did you find that courage and that strength and the conviction aside from the hunger? that actually told you, well, you know, despite everything that's in front of me, this is the right direction. People around me might still be telling me this isn't, I should be going this way instead with it now. But you, with your conviction, you thought, no, this is the way I wanted to take it. How did you continue with that conviction? It's always interesting to know people's perspective on that. That's a really great question. I think that the, the answer, honestly, is the hunger. Um, it's, if you're obsessed enough about something, um, you become stubborn after a while. I mean, and if people say that's not going to work, uh, it almost starts to fuel you. When people say that's a yeah. dumb idea, it's never going to work. I'm like, okay, now it's on. Now I have to. Uh, you yeah, know. It's good. In, yeah. in a sense, you know, one thing that this is almost hypocritical advice because I struggle with this still, but um, I'm definitely better than I was in the past. When when something doesn't go my way, right, and uh, I experience failure, and failure can be major, it can be minor, right? Mm -hmm. It can be a sales call not going the way you want it to, Absolutely. right? It's, there are lots of little, you have many, many failures and success throughout the day. Um, sure, failure can be disheartening, but I, I do to say in retrospect, when I think about it from a macro picture, which I think is the most important thing to do, is keep things in macro perspective. If you stay in the macro, you won't go off, off track. Um, so, what I, if I go, one people, a couple people have asked me in the past, if you can go back in time and tell yourself 10 years ago, five years ago, <laughs> yes, whatever, uh, you know, something, what would you tell yourself? And other than joking about what stocks to invest in, you know, um, <laughs> you know like as far as like for my own life, um, the answer is that I frankly wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go back and tell myself anything. And that's because, yeah, there are things that I, mistakes that I've made there. I failed on many, many, many things. And the funny thing is everybody talks about what they've succeeded and no one talks about what they failed. And, uh, the only reason I'm not mentioning specifics is because there's so many things I've failed in that they would be <laughs> here for three years, right? Uh, it, 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 you fail a lot, but you fail up, right? In a yeah, way. Sure. And, um, if I were to go back in time and tell my younger self, Hey, don't do this. Don't hire this person. Don't, don't go to this place. Don't, 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 you know, invest money in this area or whatever. I, I might have over gotten away from those failure points, sure, mm. but I would have had others, and uh, and I wouldn't have had the strength to, if I got to this point in my life. I never had those failures. I wouldn't have learned what I what I know now. I wouldn't have. I mean, there's some things that you can learn from hearing it from somebody else or by reading it, and you should always be in pursuit of that knowledge because that you know can save you a lot of trouble. But in some cases, you have to learn some skills the hard way, um, and I'm actually. Honestly, and I don't mean this as a cliche, I'm, I'm actually thankful that uh, things didn't mm. go my way. In fact, some of the, I would say most of what attributed to the biggest successes in my life were failures in smaller pursuits. And it's made me rethink my life. I'm like, hey, if that smaller thing I was going after didn't sure. work, yeah. why don't I go to something bigger? Why don't I think so small? Right? Uh, yeah. Well, very interesting to, uh, 
Well, I always love hearing that sort of stuff. And uh, also I liked your the, kind of the macro perspective thing. I think it's, at, I, th- I think that really is spot on because sometimes you get so caught up in the detail, don't you? You get caught up in the intricacies right in front of your face. And actually the, the, you know, you've got to do the work in terms of understanding strategy and implementation where you take your, take a step away. So, you know, and can take simpler and smaller actions after a, a setback. Now, speaking to you, you know, anyone who, who is trying to, trying to create something or build something or set up their own business, they're very much either kind of the artist, as in the person, they love to do what they do, like they love the, the actual action or they, they love the thing, or someone who's just great and really understands business. And you get, you get for example, you'll get the, the, you'll get the chef who, who loves cooking and therefore they decide to set up their own restaurant and then they realize, oh shit, this is actually, I've got to do 10 other things running a restaurant. And they realize that actually all they love to do is being the chef. They don't, it's not the management of the restaurant. To me, it sounds like maybe at least at the beginning, maybe not still now, is that you were kind of the artist. You had this, this passion for this particular thing. And I always like to understand that transition in terms of like, you want to be an artist, but you also realize that to do that, to do what you want to do, it's going to require this new business. It's going to require this new venture or whatever, that you're going to have to upskill in all of these other areas as well. Maybe the things that you're not super passionate about, but you have to upskill in terms of sales and everything else, marketing, everything else. So what did that upskilling process look like for you? And how difficult was that as you went through it when you realized, actually, I've, got to get, I've now got to get good at this. I've now got to get good at this as well as my passion. I think that the most important thing is to keep your passion, uh, keep your fuel burning. If you have the right ambition, the skill sets come pretty naturally. Um, and they can come the easy way by learning them. They can the hard way by learning the hard way. Um, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, I, I mean, I, I am passionate about business in general, but um, you know what we're doing here. I'm, I'm very passionate about what we're doing at FISMA from a technical perspective and from a macro perspective. And it's not just the day in day out of running a business. I love doing that. I do, but it's not the that's not the only thing that gets me, keeps me excited. It's the macro picture. So, uh, but I'm still excited about what I do every day. Uh, because of the macro pictures. I don't separate between the two. I don't say, well, all I, all I want to do is stay home and dream about how great it'll be when we've mm-hmm. made all these changes and we've made all this money and, and the world's totally better. No, because no, we're never going to get there that way. So I get excited about the minutia because I know that they add up to the macro. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I learned how to do the minutia because I know that if I don't learn how to do them, they won't add up to the macro. Right? Yes. It's, for me, it's, it's a necessity, but I don't lose passion. I can be very, very passionate about marketing or about sales or about, uh, or even HR matters, right? I can be very passionate about these things, not because I'm passionate about paperwork, but because I'm passionate about the effect that that's going to have on the macro picture. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's, it's always that difference uh, between, you know, I always say to people or my clients that you don't get what you want, you get what you have to have. And sort of what you're saying there is that actually these things are, as you said, a necessity to what it is that you, you want or that you need, you feel you need to do. So I totally get that. The final thing I wanted to, to touch on or, or ask about is you talked about leaving, a, wanting to leave a footprint and you know, I guess a a two part question, which is one, do you feel like at this point in time, you have left a footprint? And the second part of that question is leave, can you leave a footprint for the people listening in terms of actually from your experience and and everything you've been through that actually, if you could leave a footprint on these people or footsteps for people to follow, what is it that you might say to them? So the first part of the question, Mm -hmm. uh, and and then uh, in the second part, that's a that's a really really clever question. I, I like it a lot. Um, have I left a footprint yet? Uh, do I feel like I've left one? N- not completely. Uh, I, I feel like um, if I felt like I've already left the biggest footprint that I could leave, I would be done, right? Yeah, uh, so true, true. I'm always going to be trying to leave a bigger footprint. If I've left a little one already, uh, that, that's cute. But uh, honestly, I don't really spend much time thinking about where I am. I think more about where I need to go. Um, so I don't really put a whole lot of mental energy into have I, you know, is it a footprint? Is it just, does it just smell like a footprint? Is it just, is it a very <laughs> tiny baby like footprint? <laughs> like, 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 what, what, what is this thing, right? Have I left anything behind? I don't know. I mean, and I probably won't know. If I were to die now, I would, I would, I would die not knowing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that might be the case later, but I'm going to really pursue a really big footprint so that even if I didn't, if I don't notice that I left one behind at the time that I die, hopefully I will. I, I would like to think that I will. But, um, you know, at some point in history, that 
impact will uh, be felt uh, in a much larger way. And I realize that's what that's what the, the point sure. of it is. Like, yeah. you, you don't always realize the impact of your work until after you die. So no, I think we've got a long way to go, and I, I don't feel satisfied. I, I'm very much still thirsty you know, for, for, for uh, what we're doing. Uh, to the second part of your question, if you could, if I could leave a footprint for someone, I, I would say probably. The, if I had to narrow down every, I mean, I don't know, I've got a lot of opinions on things, um, <laughs> but if I had to leave people with one bit of advice on, on something that I think is the most impactful and the most important thing to keep in mind, it would really just be this one simple thought, and that is that we're trained, unfortunately, and we have this natural tendency from evolution to think backwards, and, uh, and that is... I, I, what paths do I have available? Which path do I want to go down? Okay, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Mm. And it's very backwards. And I can, uh, you need to think about the goal first and work your way backwards to the plan. And, and if that sounds backwards, then let me, uh, let me just come up <laughs> this. If, yeah, that might sound backwards chronologically, but it's the right way to think. Because when you want to go somewhere, I mean, if you're traveling, right, you don't, and you ask for directions from your GPS or whatever, um, you don't say, which street looks the prettiest? Okay, I'm going to go down that street. Uh -huh. Well, this street looks nice over there. I'm going to go down that street. You'll never end up anywhere. You'll just go down a bunch of pretty streets and end up God knows where. Mm -hmm. But if you know, you know where you're going and you, and so the, the directions that you take, they're, you don't even really care. You're just like, well, this is the best way to get here. You don't, you don't ask for people's opinions. You don't say, what do you think about this street? Are you proud of the street that I'm on? You don't care if they're proud. You don't really care about the street that you're on and you don't really worry about it. You're not like, oh, I don't really like the street. You don't care because you're so focused on, on where you're going, where you're actually headed, that the street is, is, is irrelevant. And so the right way to think is to start with a, a big picture. Start with a macro goal. What do you want out of life? Right? I think that's the most important question that no one's asking. Right? What do, I get one shot one very short, very important shot at life, right? No matter what your religious beliefs, we all can agree at least that, you know, as far as your current consciousness is aware, you have one shot at Absolutely. life. So what do you want out of it? If you're miserable, it's, it's really um, an opportunity wasted. So if you're, but if you're in pursuit of what you want, and you know what that is, and it's crystal clear, it doesn't have to be business, it can be anything. That's crystal clear to you. Then you should. Then obsession is a, becomes a good thing, and everything that you go through in life will become much easier and much. Um, and you'll be, you'll be have more energy. You'll have more. You'll you'll feel better about things. Failures won't be like a, won't be a big deal because you. It's, if you're if you're on your way to a store, for instance, and you know that's your your destination, you're not really too bothered by a red light or a stop sign because mm -hmm. that's just part of going to the store. It's not you're not upset. You don't say, "Oh, stop sign. Oh, I'm going home." But you don't <laughs> do that, right? So. so because so, you're so focused on, on the destination. And so if you can live your life like that, if you can apply the same amount of wisdom to your life that you apply to growing to the grocery store, you'll live a much happier life <laughs> and you'll be far more successful because you will end up going in the right direction. And, if, and little failures along the way won't bother you so much. And I think that that's the best advice I can give. If it's worth anything <laughs> uh, that, that I, I think that's a wonderful analogy and uh, and and what i've really appreciated actually on this conversation paul is that i just think you know even the, just the word obsession for so many people or may, i'd even put it not so many people too many people seems to have this negative connotation which well, for the people who you know actually finds that obsession but it has it's, it's having such a positive impact on people Obsession can be an incredible thing. And it's actually what's, as you sort of said a few times, it's sort of what is required. Because otherwise, if you don't have that thing that's a burning passion and desire to get obsessed about, I say to a lot of people, I, I did an interview recent, not so long ago, what, what would you say to people who want to get into business? I said, don't. And I said, I said, don't, because unless you have that thing, it just, you know, all the directions, all the failures you're speaking about, it just won't go. It just won't. And no. so I love your analogy at the end. And uh, all I can say to you, Paul, is firstly, I really appreciate your time. And secondly, that, you know, I wish you all the best going forward in what is a, just a, is an unbelievable pursuit, really. And it's it, what, what a pleasure to have done the, you know, done some research beforehand and, and to have been introduced to you uh, by a mutual party. But to hear even more of your story and the work you're doing is, is very inspiring for me and for the people listening. So, Paul, I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me and best to you too. Thank you.